Welcome to Ignite to Impact, a weekly podcast that explores what it takes to make your community, our nation, and the world a better place. You've tuned in to be inspired and enlightened as we pull back the curtain and dive into intimate and energetic conversations with achievers and doers. We are talking with leaders who are in the trenches making phenomenal changes through business, nonprofits, education, and the arts. Our goal? To encourage, motivate, and challenge you to go to the next level in leadership. Now, here's your host, Master Leadership Strategist, Dr. Geneva Williams. So, let's ignite to impact. Hi, this is Dr. Geneva, and welcome to Ignite to Impact, where we have conversations, great ones, about making the world a better place. And every week we bring inspiring stories, people from all walks of life, entrepreneurs, teachers, nonprofit executives, artists, everyday folk, unleashing their leadership, solving problems in their communities, creating change, and leaving impact, impact. They're fighting hunger, finding ways to end homelessness, helping children learn to read, working to eliminate poverty. Education, race relations, transportation, crime, all these issues leaders are dealing with. So we're traveling around the country, learning what real leaders do day to day, how they ignite collaboration, how they turn bad situations around and still stay excited about their own journey in leadership. And we'll also discover how these leaders build legacy to create everlasting impact. Leadership comes in many forms and shapes, you know. I believe it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, or where you live. Everyone has the ability to lead. Leadership is about influencing others to do something and everyone is called to lead in some way, sometime in life. So we're delighted to bring you those leaders who are change agents and making things better than they found them. Now, have you ever seen Beauty on Ice? I mean, have you ever just watched a silhouette figure or two on the ice and look at the magic that's created as two people twirl and whirl and keep up with wonderful music playing in the background and do incredible twists and turns? Well, you might think that's something, which it is. But I know someone who does even more than that because she does those incredible twists and turns with young people helping them find a better life and that's my guest today Meryl Hmm. Davis thank you for having me (laughs) you know I'm just so excited she's the Olympic star ice no no you know what We've said so many different titles. And see, with Meryl, you can say all those different titles because she means so much. In fact, she was, in 2006, the U.S. Junior National Ice Skating Dancing Champ. In 2006, she was also the Junior World Ice Dancing Figure Skating Bronze Medalist. She was the National Ice Dance, National Ice Dancing Bronze Medalist, the National Ice Dancing Dancing Silver Medalist, and I could go on and on. Your latest honor mm-hmm. is what? Uh, well, the big one is the mm-hmm. Olympics. At the that, Olympics, <laughs> that's yes. uh, you know you have your figure skating fans, and then you have your sports fans and mm-hmm. you know every four years Olympic watchers and so generally the Olympics is the big one so yes. um, my partner Charlie and I won the ice dancing gold medal in mm-hmm. the 2014 games uh, mm-hmm. after winning the silver medal in the 2010 games. Mm-hmm. Olympic champions. Mm-hmm. Uh, first time ever U.S. 
Yeah, first time what? ever American Olympic champions in our sport in mm-hmm. ice dance. Mm-hmm. Which Just is such an honor. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. And then you turned around and you did something else, Dancing with the Stars. That's right. <laughs> yes, I, I won that too, which is, it's, it was a wonderful time. Um, I had a great experience. It I've referred to it before as sort of feeling like summer camp. You know, you're on it for, for three months and it, it feels like it's your life and you're in this sort of whirlwind um, and then it's over. Um, and it's, it's funny because oftentimes people will ask me like, well, what was, you know, what do, do you feel more pressure doing? Like the Olympics mm-hmm. or Dancing with the Stars or, you know, what means more to you winning the Olympics or Dancing with the Stars? And, um, you know, while Dancing with the Stars was so much fun. Um, the Olympics, it, it was my lifelong dream, you know, and, and it's, of course, it's it's the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And um, to get there, you you really have to dedicate your life. Um, and so that's something that my, my partner, Charlie, and I are very, very proud of. Mm-hmm. And we're all very, very proud of you. Thank you. So I've got to tell my um, listening audience that I have known this champion for, I guess it's been about a year now. Um, and we're going to talk about um, really some of uh, the work that she's doing, and you'll see how I know her. But that's not why I had her on the show to talk about. Well, yes, we'll hear a little bit about dancing on the ice. We'll hear a little bit about dancing the stars. Um, but why I wanted her to be on Ignite to Impact is what she's doing with young people, you know, and it is phenomenal. So we're going to get into that. But before that, Meryl, tell us what what it was like growing up. How were you as a little girl? Sure. Um, well, when I was a very little girl, I was incredibly outgoing, um, just no fear in the world, just, you know, jumping off of you know, things I shouldn't have been jumping off of and diving into things I shouldn't have been diving into and just really (laughs) athletic and adventurous and no fear. Um, And I started to struggle in school, maybe in like, I wanna say third or fourth grade, maybe even earlier, maybe second grade. And um, when I I really started to struggle um, and realize that learning was something that was a little bit different for me, I think I really internalized that and it had an impact on my personality, on my self-confidence. And so around like maybe fourth grade, I maybe fifth grade transitioned from being a really outgoing, adventurous little girl Mm -hmm. into being sort of self-conscious and keeping to myself. Mm. And I think while I had already fallen in love with figure skating, as I became more self-conscious and aware of things that, you know, made me feel um, aware of sort of my insecurities, I really took to skating as sort of a safe place. Skating okay. was always my place where I felt uninhibited. It was a place where I felt free and um, just a world of possibility. Mm-hmm. So I think my my love for skating really started as Um, a place that was in stark contrast from maybe the rest of of my experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so as a young girl, so you started around... I started skating when I was five years old. Five years Mm -hmm. old. So what was that like, skating at that young age? Did you see yourself as an Olympian? Did you see yourself going? Was it just fun or... Tell us about that mm-hmm. experience at such a young age. Well, I grew up skating on a lake in West Bloomfield mm-hmm. in the winter uh, with neighborhood kids and started taking lessons, like I said, um, when I was five. And I just fell in love with it. I mm-hmm. had a lot of energy. Um, I was always very athletic. And so to be able to channel that energy and, um, you know, into something that was not just physical, but also skating to, as you said, beautiful music and mm-hmm. wearing, mm-hmm. you know, beautiful mm-hmm. costumes. Mm-hmm. And it was just something that I fell madly in love with from the start. Um, and I just never looked back. <laughs> mm. And so what, how, how did your parents relate to all of this? Yeah. Um, because I know it's not just an, an investment of you and your time. That's right. It's got to bring in family. My parents I are just the most, first off, 
above everything else. They're just like the kindest people. Mm -hmm. Um, And through skating, um, and it's, you know, it's kind of an anomaly when you have your kids in sport or some sort of after school Mm -hmm. activity. But my parents always just were of the philosophy that, you know, if you're having fun, if you're enjoying it, Mm -hmm. let's keep it going. If not, we'll find something else. And, um, you know, it was always really something that, um, I was the one who was really pushing it and wanted to take it further and, and wanted more lessons and wanted to be spending more time at the rink. And um, my parents just were incredibly supportive, whether it's, you know, sitting there and cheering me on in the stands, um, you know, giving me a pat on the back and a boost when I things might have not have been going as well, or even, you know, just driving me to and from school yes. and the rink mm-hmm. and um, just the sacrifice that they made, you know, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. financially, um, you know, time wise and, and just letting me go after my dream is, um, you know, something I'll never be able to thank them enough for. Mm-hmm. And so how did you, how did you balance school? I, as I said, I had some learning, I had, uh, or I have a learning disability, I'm dyslexic. Okay. And so around um, third, fourth, fifth grade, things started becoming challenging. And um, so whether it was, you know, spending more time doing homework maybe than the other kids or you know having help from my parents on homework or studying I just loved skating so much that I knew from a time point of view I just was going to make it work Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and so there were definitely times when you know my parents would say like okay you it, you need to go to bed you're 10 (laughs) years old and it's it's time to stop doing your homework but you know I would creep up sometimes in the middle of the night and Mm -hmm. finish my homework Um, but I just I knew that I don't know if it was that I had something I wanted to prove but I wanted Mm -hmm. to be ready every Mm -hmm. day whether it was at school or at skating and I wanted to show up and be prepared and so um, you know sometimes there were long nights trying to squeeze it all in but um, it's just that's just the way that it was (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what about um competing Mm -hmm. what what age did you start competing and and what were some of the um things you learned about competition and being Mm -hmm. on ice well i probably started competing at about six years old Mm -hmm. um as a lot of young figure skaters do and um at that age i was still quite fearless um not a lot of nerves at that point But um, as is quite common, I think I started to realize later, like, oh my goodness, I'm performing in front of other people and I could potentially fall on my bum and (laughs) that's embarrassing. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I think I dealt with a normal amount of, you know, the nerves sort of playing a part. Mm -hmm. And as I grew older and the stakes got higher and, um, you know, I was investing more time, my parents were investing more time, you know, it means more. It's not just fun. It's something that you've put a lot of time and effort into. Your family puts a lot of time and effort into. And so you want to do well, not only because, you know, that's appealing, but you want to do well because you want to make other people proud. You want to do well because um, you've put a lot into it. And so I think for me, that's where over the course of my skating career, my competitive career, that's where a lot of the nerves came from, is just wanting to do justice to everything that had gone into, um, you know, that part of my life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what did you think about, um, you know, try to, I've always wanted, I've always wanted to know about this, and, and it, particularly an athlete, mm-hmm like you what goes on in your head (laughs) when you're you know it's that moment that music is starting like when you performed Mm -hmm. the winning routine Mm -hmm. um, that earned you and Charlie the Olympic gold what was in your head What's going through your mind? It's interesting you say when the music starts, because by the time the music starts, as a figure skater, you sort of, I don't want to say you go into um, autopilot, but 
you know, by the time you get to a competition like the Olympic Games, you're so incredibly well trained. You've mm-hmm. run your program mm-hmm. countless amounts of times. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by the time the music starts to play, your body kind of just knows what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's before the music starts that's a little bit scary. (laughs) Okay, so tell us about that. Yeah, (laughs) so I mean, you, in figure skating, we have our um, warm-ups in groups, and so in ice dancing, um, where, you know, we have partners, it's two people, uh, typically it's four or five teams on the ice warming up at a time. Um, So you have your five minutes to warm up all of the things that you're going to do in your program. Um, You get off the ice and then there's a skating order. So Mm -hmm. if you are the the first team, you stay on the ice after the warm up, you do your program and get off. Whereas if you're the fourth or fifth team, you've had your warm up, you get off the ice and you sort of wait backstage Mm -hmm. listening to everyone else's music play and Mm -hmm. their scores being read. And that's the scary part, (laughs) you know, being sort of like on deck is Uh the the Uh nerve wracking aspect. (laughs) So what order were you in for that, uh, the Olympic gold performance? Yeah, Charlie and I skated last. Um, Actually, Mm -hmm. we skated last in all our events at maybe both Olympics actually. no, actually, only in Sochi. We skated last all of our events. But, um, yes, we definitely heard people's scores being read. <laughs> we knew that they were high, and we were like, oh, my goodness. We did not want to hear that at all. Mm-hmm. But um, the pressure was on, and despite the fact that the nerves, as I said, mm-hmm. it means a lot, and you want to do as well as you possibly can, of course, obviously, at the Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. Um, because so much has gone into it, we really did know that we were ready. Mm-hmm, um, you know, mm-hmm, we had put mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. possible into preparing for that moment. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's what calms the butterflies. When you get to yes. that point and, you know, you're sort of standing on the edge saying, okay, well, it's time, it's mm-hmm, go time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what I always tell myself and, and what I always find reassuring is just knowing that I've put in the work and mm-hmm. there was nothing else to be mm-hmm. done. And so whether it goes well or it goes not as well, you can't have any regrets because you knew you knew you were going to do or you knew you had done everything you could to, mm-hmm. to put out um, the best program you could. Mm-hmm. And so what lessons did you learn from that experience? So many. I, I really feel, and of course... I competed in figure skating for, oh my goodness, um, I mean, almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, it, it would take a lifetime to talk about all of the many lessons I, mm-hmm. I learned on the ice, but um, figuring out that getting up when you make a mistake, you know, whether it's literally getting up when you fall or, or something like that, or figuratively just picking yourself back up when things don't go well, I think that's probably the main takeaway mm-hmm. from figure skating. Um, and just trusting in hard work to take mm-hmm. you to where you wanna go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think so many of those important lessons that you learn on the ice um, or in, in sport in general really do um, serve you well later on in life, off the ice as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those are things that as I sort of try to figure out what my next career move might be or what my next step in life might be, those are lessons that I I really start to realize, Mm -hmm. you know, they're applicable no matter what it is Mm -hmm. you're doing. So can you give us a peek into any of those potential career, next career moves? Oh, it's a great question. And it in my head, it changes all the time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm going to school right now. Okay. I'm getting a de- an undergraduate degree in anthropology. Mm-hmm. Um, just a couple semesters left. So mm-hmm. I feel like that's a good start. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll figure out uh, what my next steps might be. But like any good millennial, uh, <laughs> I feel as though, you know, I, I think our parents generations more associated with like a quote like job description or like a title Mm -hmm. Um, and I think as many millennials do it's we realize that you don't necessarily have to have like a quote job Mm -hmm. Um, and I I guess I'm excited to experiment with a lot of different things and Mm -hmm. and sort of figure out what feels right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) well certainly this latest venture that you're in, transferring, um, sharing, 
uh, many of the lessons you've learned on ice with young girls um, is is something special. Tell us about it. Well, it feels silly to be telling you about it, <laughs> being the head of the organization, but um, we are working with a just fantastic organization called Figure Skating in Detroit, uh, which is the first branch program of an organization called Figure Skating in Harlem, which has had just an incredible amount of success over the last 20 years. Um, it's an organization that I had worked with um, a little bit for the last four or five years. And, oh no, actually, I guess like seven years now. Wow, mm -hmm. time certainly flies. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially, it's a youth development program for girls using figure skating as an educational tool for young girls to not only understand their own possibility, um, to realize their own potential on the ice, but as we talked about, to use those lessons, to use those life skills off the ice as well. Um, and so we try to apply those. Um, we have some off ice um, sessions, some tutoring, um, some academics involved, but just working to set up girls for success now and later in life. Mm. Um, and it is the first program of its kind. And so the fact that Detroit was chosen as the first branch city of this fantastic organization is really exciting. Um, why do you think that was? Why, why choose yeah. Detroit? You know, a program like this could probably go anywhere. Right. Uh, why Detroit? What, and how was that decision made? Well, uh, the leader in New York, the lady who founded the organization, as you know, Sharon Cohen, um, was looking at a couple different cities. And so I knew that um, it was going to be my job to sell her on Detroit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't too tough of a sell, to be honest. You know, I think the two main things that we have over a lot of other cities in the U.S. for this program is <clears throat> the figure skating community is very strong here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of success over the last several decades, um, not only with local skaters, local talent, but people coming and moving to Detroit from not just across the country, but all over the world um, to train with some of the best coaches we have here, top training facilities. And so to have that community of support, people who really understand the value of figure skating, not just at an elite level, but what figure skating can do for young ladies mm -hmm. um, is an incredible asset for a program like this. Um, and then of course, just the energy surrounding Detroit today is unlike anything else. Um, the idea of the revitalization of Detroit, I think, is largely dependent on our youth and where they take that potential for our city. Um, it's dependent upon their ability to see their own potential for success and for impact, um, you know, not just here, but across the country, across the world. And so the combination of that figure skating community and mm -hmm. that Detroit community and that beautiful energy that we have um, creates just this really wonderful combination and um, just fantastic, limitless potential for a figure skating program for young women in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So Meryl, okay, so in Detroit, the program only for Detroit girls, mm -hmm. um, predominantly um, girls of color, mm -hmm. who probably haven't had the opportunity to ice skate, right? figure skate, uh, lots of roller skating, mm -hmm. certainly a lot of dancing and music. Uh, in Detroit and for girls. So what makes you think that figure skating can work here in Detroit? Well, figure skating, I think, is very special in that it is a beautiful combination of athleticism and physicality with art and music and theatricality and integrating all different aspects of culture into sport, and that I think is very rare. Mm -hmm. But I think more than that, it's about you. It's about picking yourself up when you fall, as everyone does on the ice. It's about learning your own strength. It's about learning to stand on your own two feet and make something beautiful. 
And I think given the right opportunity, I think that is appealing for the vast majority of young people. Um, And I also think that the beauty of this program is in pushing girls to try something new and see that they can do it, you know? And so I think that, you know, it can work with other sports as well, but the fact that this program is giving these girls, as you said, who may not have had an opportunity to skate before or do a lot of other activities or sports before, an opportunity to say, you've never done this before, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. And then one day, two days, three days later, thinking, look how far I've come in just Mm -hmm. a short amount of time Mm -hmm. with a little bit of work. And that's what we want them to see. That's what we want them to understand is, it's not about skating, you know, it's not about becoming an Olympic champion. It's not about being, you know, the best figure skater in the world. It's about understanding that, you know, when you buckle down, when you believe in yourself, anything is possible. Um, And sure, we may get a couple girls who just fall in love with figure skating, but the goal is to get 100% of the girls involved to be impacted by understanding their own value and possibility. And figure skating is really just a vehicle to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So, so, so rightly put, because as, as you were talking, you know, when I was visualizing and thinking about the artistry and the beauty of figure skating, I, I also recognize that, you know, another jewel of the program is the whole leadership development, mm-hmm. the 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 academic um, emphasis, and all of that. So it's like a double whammy of goodness. That Absolutely, has come. I think when you give gir- young girls, especially, the power to understand their own strength, there is no limit to mm-hmm. what they're capable mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. and to be able to see where each girl takes that understanding is fascinating because I think each girl will take it in a different direction. Um, And you will see whether it is um, young leaders or understanding how to work together as a community or support one another. Um, You know, we just, as you know, and as I've mentioned, Geneva is the head of this organization in Detroit. (laughs) And so um, I'm sure she has a lot to share about her experience with the organization as well, but we just had our first week-long summer camp um, called Dreaming With Eyes Wide Open. And it was a a five-day camp uh, with girls uh, from the city, many of them experiencing skating for the first time. And to just see the way that they interacted with one another, I think was one of the things I I expected, but I didn't expect to be so affected by it. Um, You know, a girl maybe would fall and then two of her friends that she had met that morning or or the day before would come over and say, oh, it's okay, like, come skate with us. And, you know, they grab each other's hands and skate away. Or, um, you know, one girl will accidentally run into the other one because they're just learning to skate and the other girl cries and gets upset and then you have this conversation about, you know, sometimes things happen by accident but you need to talk about it and understand where the other person's coming from and maybe she didn't do it on purpose and just these really, really important lessons are so integrated into the functionality of the program. Um, So to see the relationships and the understanding of the way one interacts with another person, I think was really fascinating to see over the course of those days. Mm -hmm. That building too of that sisterhood, Mm -hmm. that camaraderie that really makes a difference. And yeah, you know, yeah, I know a little bit about the program, but (laughs) I asked you on because I'm... You know, as, as I think about what makes a difference in community and with young people, it's about adults. Mm-hmm. It really is. And I'm always fascinated by the um, ability of adults to mold and shape. Mm-hmm. And when that's done intentionally, 
to help young people. I think it's just part of what helps young people grow and develop. And I have watched you over the past year work with these young girls. And, um, well, I'll give you a good example. A young lady was in the... um, uh, uh, program this the summer camp program nice little young lady in fact she was my granddaughter mm-hmm. and she <laughs> fell or started crying or some she had some boo boo or something happened and I saw it and I you know kind of almost held out my arms expecting her to rush into my arms <laughs> and tell me her problems and she looked at me smiled and turned around and looked for you (laughs) and ran into your arms. Someone that she had just met. And see, I think that's the, there's a power in that. What do you think about that, Mel? You're absolutely right. There's a camaraderie that comes with the understanding of just how special figure skating really is. And mm-hmm. as we said, I think this idea can work with a lot of different sports or activities. Um, but, you know, there's a reason I'm a figure skater. And mm-hmm. it, it, there's just this magic of gliding mm-hmm. across the ice and mm-hmm. figure skating. And as I talked about, that that blend of athleticism and artistry that you can't find anywhere else. And I think that it really inspires this camaraderie, whether it is an eight-year-old and a 30-year-old just enjoying skating Mm -hmm, together on mm -hmm. the ice or understanding that common ground. Um, And I think that's part of the beauty of the program as well. And um, But you could choose to do other things. You could choose, I mean, you won Dancing of the of the stars. Was mm-hmm. that the name of Dancing of the Stars? Dancing with the stars. Dancing yeah. with the stars. <laughs> I mean, it is so popular. You won that. Your Olympic gold. Yeah. You've been <clears throat> all over the world. You could have done lots of other things. Yeah. Why are you in Detroit, igniting your impact with these Detroit girls? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because. My, when I was majoring, when I was trying to figure out my major in college, um, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college or in life in general. And my dad said, just go with what interests you, just go with what feels right. And I think that's very applicable to my skating career, um, to my involvement with this organization. It just, it's what interests me, it's what feels right, and it's the place that I feel authentically me. Um, And I think that's part of why. I love this program so much. It's why I love relating to the girls and sitting and talking to the girls so much is I can be authentic. I can be myself because I 100% believe in the program. I believe in figure skating's ability and the lessons you learn in figure skating to transcend the ice. Um, And so I think when you put yourself in situations where you can just be authentically you, um, it's much more... um, it's much easier to be successful and and have an impact. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I feel really fortunate to be in that position that I am able to just authentically be myself and and hopefully create a positive impact on these young girls. Well, you absolutely have done that. And the authenticity oozes (laughs) out of you. You And the girls, I mean, um, if my listening audience could have seen uh, these girls, you know, it was over 60, some girls uh, at the camp. They all knew Meryl. They all had, well, they all wanted an opportunity to interact with her, and they all got it. <laughs> and um, she was on the ice all the time, talking to them, coaching with them. But even before that, we had a series of workshops with parents, and you had a lot of conversation with parents Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. um, You know, I am an Olympic champion and I feel very fortunate to be that. And oftentimes I think that um, that idea of success for a lot of people feels out of reach. And I think when they get to know someone who has, you know, 
done something maybe they haven't met someone who's done that before or had that you know success in that field before and they realize you're just another person Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. it sort of puts into perspective that it's possible for anyone Mm -hmm. slash them to accomplish Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think in talking with these girls you know at first they get excited because they know I'm an Olympic champion and you know, it's, oh my gosh, I can't believe you won the Olympics and do you have an Olympic gold medal? Oh my goodness, that's so crazy. But then when they realize I'm just another person skating on the ice with them, whether consciously or subconsciously, I think they realize it's possible for a normal person to do because that Olympic champion is just a normal person who worked really hard to achieve something. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think getting to make that connection for young people is very important. And you do it so well. Thank you. You do it with the grace and the artistry uh, that you display on the ice. And, you know, we're just uh, very blessed and fortunate in the uh, Detroit area to have you igniting your impact with us in this way. So, Merrill Davis, thank you so much. And congratulations on your recent engagement. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Yes. Oh, yes. I know. Oh, it's, yes. Uh, the ring, if you were here and saw this <laughs> ring, you'd see it. Gl- it's blinding me. You did, did a very good job. <laughs> yes, it, it's yes. blinding me, but thank you for best having of me. everything to you always. Thank you, you too. Thank you. You've been listening to Ignite to Impact. Your host is Dr. Geneva Williams, an award-winning executive, facilitator, and master leadership strategist. Dr. Geneva is dedicated to inspiring others to get their leadership on and equipping the next generation with leadership tools and tips to help make the world a better place. Sign up to download Dr. Geneva's mini ebook on leadership. Get the show notes, links, and other resources at drgenevaspeaks.com. That's drgenevaspeaks.com. Thanks for listening. Please share the podcast to those in your community via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Google+. And leave us a five-star review in iTunes. When you do that, it helps others find the podcast easier. Send your questions or comments to info at drgenevaspeaks.com.